me start off with this one. It's an evolution question, Pastor Steve. Um, and it's from Daniel. And he says this, I have a couple questions that I can't find answers to. Uh, my friend keeps pushing for the fact that evolution is true. I was able to dispel some of his questions, but the ones I'm having a rough time with are, what are male nipples for and what are wisdom teeth for? And you can go on to people say, well, what's the tailbone for? And they're trying to use these things that the human body doesn't use to prove that evolution is over time. So what would you tell Daniel on answers for that? Well, um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, people don't realize when, when they're talking about creation versus evolution is, you know, he, he, what he's thinking is, is that because uh, men have nipples, then, um, you know, that's, that's like uh, something that's uh, useless for men and therefore it's some kind of evolutionary uh, byway and that, that kind of thing. Well, the reality is, is that when uh, you're talking about the, uh, the development of, of people, um, you, you basically have this, this situation where uh, God is, um, how, how would you say this? Uh, the, the design is something that's basic and then God jumps off from that. And this is what I mean by that. Um, when you're, when you're talking about the flesh of animals versus the flesh of people, there are some differences as far as DNA goes, but as far as structure and that kind of thing, God, God is an economist when it comes to structure. And so, you know, we don't have to have animals that look completely different on every single level than every other animal. It's, it's just good design. And so if my arm works well this way and you know, it functions for the kind of animal that I am, which is a human being. That that doesn't preclude God using the same structure when you're when you're talking about uh, you know other animals, whether you're whether you're talking about primates or whether you're talking about uh, other animals on other levels, joints and and bones and ligaments and and all that kind of thing. Um, uh, it's a it's a conservative design, and so uh, when when you're when you're talking about the issue of evolution, um, the whole idea of vestigial organs, and that's what he's talking about. The whole, st whole idea of vestigial organ organs um, has been pretty much uh, uh, taken away. So, you know, like they, they talk about wisdom teeth and, and that kind of thing. Well, I had wisdom teeth and it's more teeth, mm -hmm. you know? So wisdom teeth are, are teeth. Mm -hmm. And so you just have more teeth in your mouth. So? You know, I, I, I've never understood the whole idea that uh, wisdom teeth are vestigial uh, because if you can chew with wisdom teeth, then what's the difference? Teeth are teeth. And they've done this whole thing with, uh, um, uh, for example, the appendix. And uh, for a long time, it was considered to be vestigial. And uh, what we found out now is that, is that the appendix has... Uh, some uh, major, there's a major need for your appendix as far as your immune system goes. And they've done this with the spleen. They've done this with, with different organs on the inside of your body. They've done this with a coccyx, the tailbone. Well, the, you know, the reason that we have a tailbone is because it's vestigial. No, the reason you have a tailbone is because there's muscles that are attached to it, you know, in your, in your gluteus maximus. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's needed. And so uh, the, the fact that somebody is looking at the human body and doesn't understand what an organ or what something is, is doing right at this moment, uh, the fact that they don't understand that doesn't mean that it's vestigial. What it means is they don't understand it yet. And so um, I don't know any vestigial organs that, um, that uh, scientists uh, don't know, the, you know basically the answers to. And so when you're talking about the appendix and and, and when you're when you're talking about wisdom teeth and you're talking about all those things, there are good answers for that. And uh, you know, basically, I think the wisdom teeth thing is just you know that's a that's a red herring. Teeth are teeth, mm -hmm. and so if you have more teeth in your mouth, uh, I don't know better. You know, uh, another thing that that you need to keep in mind with this, and just talking about the tooth thing, is that your your skull changes based on the kind of uh, environment that you're in the the body is made to adapt and and so uh, when you are talking about the skull shape of Europeans basically uh, and uh, say well I've done studies on this Europeans versus Eskimos and in the Eskimo culture and I don't I don't know that it's like that uh, so much today but we're, what we're talking about is back in the 1800s they use their teeth radically all the time and so their jaws were massive 
and and so they would do things like they would they would they would use their teeth to chew um, to basically chew skin to cure hides and and that kind of thing and so what it did was it shaped their heads because because as you're growing if you're using your jaw on hard foods or in the way that the Eskimos were using it for a tool what happens is your jaws get bigger and and it pulls on your skull and so it shapes your skull literally shapes your skull differently than people from other countries and so uh, for example in Europe uh, Europeans have this tendency to have high foreheads and um, you know that most of most of white America is European there's a difference between um, uh, American Europeans and European Europeans in the in the sense of their face structure and, and its shape and that kind of thing and it has to do with what the foods that we eat and so again when you're talking about things that are going on in your jaw well you know if there's a if there's a period of time when the jaw is being used used differently um, then things like wisdom teeth are going to be things that you know people might want to pull because their jaw isn't as elongated and that kind of stuff and that's that's micro evolution. That's that, that's called adaptation over time. It's not macro evolution. Mm -hmm. Anybody who knows anything about evolution has no problem with micro evolution, right? Uh, because obviously, rabbits become snow, snowshoe rabbits, hares, uh, cottontail rabbits. You know, there's all these different kinds of rabbits. They came from a ba a basic rabbit, and there's enough. Uh, genetic diversity inside the rabbit kind to get all these different kinds of rabbits. Well, you get the same thing with humans, and that's where you get races. What we call races, the Bible calls families, um, but uh, that's where that's where you get that kind of stuff. And so, with the with the nipple issue, it's it's the idea of the, that the embryo, when it's growing, there's certain things that take place that um, that uh, as far as uh, hormonally and that kind of stuff that uh, determine. Um, gender and uh, specific personality and, and that kind of thing. And uh, you also, and I'm not saying that men and women are exactly the same because they're, they're, they're literally chromosomally different. Right. Um, but when you're, when you're talking about body shape, you know, why are women, you know, shaped anything like men? You know, it's like, it's like, well, because the design is the design and, you know, that's, that's the way that it goes. And yeah. so, I've, I've never had a problem with nipples, you know, and I don't know all the reasons for that. And, and uh, you know, I mean, we could get into erogenous zones and all kinds of stuff like that. And, but if, if that's his big deal with evolution, that's pretty lame. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like there are, there are bigger issues to, to talk about. So is that the is that the only one that he had? Yeah. No, that was it. You know, um, what's his name again? Uh, Daniel. Daniel. Um, when you're talking about evolution, you can't even get past chemical evolution. And so when when somebody comes up and starts talking to me about appendixes and teeth and and nipples, I'm I'm like, you know, dude, explain chemical evolution to me. And that's the idea that in the uh, at the very beginning, you you always hear this whole thing about uh, there was primordial ooze and and there was organic soup in the ocean and life came from the oceans and and uh, all that kind of stuff. And and basically, this is the this is the way that life goes. You have to have amino acids to get proteins, okay? And so amino acids are, are pretty complex molecules. And, and so there, there have been experiments where people uh, brought about amino acids by doing a chemical gaseous mix and passing electricity through it. The problem with that experiment, it's called the Miller-Urey experiment, and uh, uh, most people who know anything about evolution know, know what I'm talking about. Problem with that experiment is that experiment um, uses gases that um, weren't gases that were on the planet in the first place. Those are gases that are like on Jupiter. It's called it's called a reducing atmosphere. There's no evidence that Earth ever had a reducing atmosphere. So number, problem number one is you don't have a chemical makeup to get amino acids on the planet in the first place. That's the first problem. Even if you did have the chemical makeup for the for the amino acids, when they made these when they did this experiment, um, you in the end, when you get the amino acids, there are two things that end up happening. One thing is you get an amino acid plus water. And to keep the amino acid, you have to get rid of the water because the water breaks down the chemical structure of amino acids. And so they had, they had a distillation trap on this whole contraption to get rid of water. Well, um, and, and again, the reason is because you can't gel basically an amino acid with water in the mix. And so the one place that life did not come from on this planet is the oceans. You can't get the chemical process to work. 
The other thing is when the amino acids came out, they came out uh, with, uh, uh, with a dual chorality. And chorality is the idea of uh, handedness. And so you know what molecules look like, you know, the little balls all connected and that kind of stuff. And one of the things that you have with molecules is that, is that they can be mirror images of each other. And so when you're talking about amino acids that came out of that experiment um, specifically, they were both right-handed and left-handed as far as chorality goes. That means handedness. And, and so they are molecules that have shapes that will bond with each other in a right-handed way and a left-handed way. Here's the problem. All life is made of left-handed amino acids. No right-handed amino acids, just left-handed. Right-handed amino acids are poisonous to life. And so not only do you have to get rid of water in that experiment or, or in getting life in the first place, you have to be able to get rid of all the right-handed amino acids in the mix. And the way the chemistry goes is you get an equal mix of them. So you gotta you have to have some kind of filter that gets rid of all right-handed amino acids. So you got nothing but left-handed amino acids, so that they'll join like this. Once you put a right-handed amino acid in, it stops the chain of molecules, and you can't get the proteins that you need for life. And so this is what I'm telling you: when you're talking about evolution, um, evolution is, the big problem with evolution is not going from animal to animal, you know to you know, to different kind of animals. The big problem in evolution is getting started. You can't even get past chemical evolution in this whole thing. And so, uh, again, when I when I look at this stuff, there there are guys that will uh, point out little piddly issues um, when the problem with evolution is not piddly. It's mm -hmm. it's huge. And then that's just getting to simple um, proteins. Getting to simple proteins. Then you got to go from proteins, you're, you're starting to use proteins and you're using enzymes. And, and when you're talking about a human or a, any kind of cell, it is so radically complex. It's been compared to a small city. Yeah. And so there, there are, are membranes on a cell that allow water to come in, don't allow water to go out. There's, you know, you've got all this, it's radically complex. And so you got to go from the complexity of getting from amino acids to a protein, and then you have to go from proteins uh, to the actual um, uh, construction of a cell and all the complexity that's involved in that and all the diversity as far as the different parts go and the different, the, uh, it's a machine basically just to get one cell. And then you're talking about mul you know, multiple trillions of cells mm -hmm. in a human body that are all made and designed and work together to make a human be able to live. And uh, when, uh, when you're talking about single-celled life forms, radically complex, and you can just take that and multiply that by orders of magnitude when you're talking about uh, humans or any, any kind of higher form of life. It's just, it's just ridiculously complex. Mm -hmm. If uh, we had known about the complexity of the, of the, of the human genome, DNA, Everything that goes along with it. If we'd have known about that in the 1800s, evolution never would have got off the ground. Well, there, he, Darwin it, himself said it, basically his whole theory is based off of the simple cell. Yeah. But he didn't know because he couldn't look into it that it wasn't so simple. Yeah, it's not simple. And and uh, uh, so we're we're talking we're talking about huge problems. Um, for me to believe in evolution, I'd have to have have much greater faith. Yeah. Than it takes for me to believe that there's a creator and that he designed it. The design is all over. Uh, the um, the creation as as far as biology goes, it's you know uh, even when you pick up biology books, they talk about the 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 DNA code, and that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. You realize DNA is a code. It's it's digital. It's not an analog code. It's a digital code. And um, again, what you're what you're talking about is is a complexity that's. That's so ridiculously over the top that it can't happen by chance. It has to be designed. And, and so it's, it's the idea of a, a bunch of alphabet letters laying here and somehow they blew up into a book with page numbers and chapters organized into paragraphs and everything yeah. for the structures of life. And people say, well, there's no intelligent design. It just it exploded and it all randomly came together it's in that nonsense. perfect way. Yeah. It's yeah. almost hysterical when you actually look at the basic simple right. facts. And you know, um, you will uh, just just the illustration that you used. Uh, um, 
It was an illustration that was given back in the 1800s of a group of monkeys typing on typewriters and coming up with Shakespeare's plays. And so, you know, somebody back in the in the 1980s tried to do it with with a computer, and you know, they came up with intelligible sentences and and that kind of stuff. But what they had to do was they had to design the program in such a way that the nonsense gets pulled out. That that um, when when you're having these random typings on a computer keyboard or on a typewriter that every time a nonsense um, letter gets pulled in, put in there that the program in some way blocks that letter from being put back in so that over time that you, you can get something intelligible. That is not what we have in the real world. What we have is what's called an open system and you don't have a way to get rid of the nonsense um, and especially when again when you're talking about chemical evolution. Evolution is not chemically possible and it's not biologically possible either. And more and more scientists are coming to the understanding that that's the truth. And so uh, I was, I used to be a convinced evolutionist and um, I only got, I didn't even get half the story. And once I started getting the full story on the complexity that we're dealing with, I, it's, I don't believe it at all. I don't, I have a major problem with evolution. I think it's nonsense. Because of the science and, and all the things you pointed out, uh, even in just a simple level, now they're moving not to uh, evolution type of scientific arguments and stuff, but they're moving into, okay, what was the thing that created this? And they're moving to look into life forms and aliens yeah. and things like that because um, they know that it just didn't all happen by right. random chance. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that Matt is talking about here is that, the, that there's more and more, when, when you uh, pick up uh, science periodicals, there's more and more um, conversation about life uh, being seeded on the Earth. And so maybe the amino acids came from asteroids. Maybe the amino acids uh, came from comets and, <clears throat> and that kind of thing. And the reason that they're doing that is because chemical evolution is impossible on the planet. That's why they're doing it, mm -hmm. and and so uh, they're they're looking for other issues there. And they're, they're not going to flat out come out and tell you that chemical evolution is impossible on the planet Earth, and so we have to look elsewhere. Um, you know, but what they're what they're doing, it's kind of like they kind of try to get their ducks in a row before they come up with a new hypothesis because this one has been discredited, and so chemical evolution on the planet has been discredited, and so they're not going to tell you that, but they're going to look for other options to see if they can come up with something. And they have a, found amino acids on, uh, on uh, uh, cometary bodies and, and uh, I believe on asteroids too. I'd have to go back and check my facts on that. But again, le left-handed, right-handed, can't have anything to do with water. You know, and you have to have a process that puts these long, they're, call, they're called polymers. It's, they're long chain molecules. And, and you have to have a process that puts all these molecules together leaving out right-handed amino acids and that, that kind of stuff. And so the, the odds of, the, of that happening. You know, evolution is chance plus time means we go from goo to you. And um, chance plus time will not get you chemical evolution, whether it comes from a comet or whether it comes out of organic soup. Doesn't matter. You can't get it. And so um, it's a, it's it, the chances of it are so minuscule that it's an impossibility. And so, yeah. Okay.